people are blind in this world, and I'm not talking about physical blindness, a gross darkness, a spiritual darkness. It's a blindness to God. They don't know God. I didn't know God for 18 years of my life until I received Christ October 5th, 1977 on a Wednesday night between about 8.30 and 9. I was in darkness, deep darkness. People don't see Jesus. I mean, they know about him, but they don't really see him. They're in thick darkness. They don't have experience of him. They don't see the light. They that sit in darkness have seen a great light, so the prophet said, and Matthew quoted, in the book of Matthew, these guys, Caiaphas and Annas and all the Sanhedrin, whoever were in that group, um, you know, they were in darkness. They couldn't see that there's their Messiah right there. Super, super sad. And by the way, Jesus was blindfolded physically. And like I said, you know, they, they hit him. They hit him with their fists. They blindfolded him and said, prophesy. They hit him. Like, think about this. And I've thought about this many, many times. If, you're, if you've got a blindfold on and, and you can't even see the punch coming, a, and some of them could have been a few soldiers or servants or something, not soldiers of the Roman army, but the guard, the Levite guards who were standing there at that trial. And they, they were men, and they hit him with their fists, jacked him up like it's horrible. And he couldn't even see. No, he couldn't flinch like, oh, my goodness, here it comes. He couldn't see it. Just can you feel that? That's amazing. And Jesus took that physical darkness so that he could bring us light and bring us understanding. What a Savior. And they really, I hate to say it, but they really bloodied him up. They hit him with rods. So one of the Greek words is actually rods and not palms, palms of the hand. It could have been the both palms and rods at this point. He went through way worse physical stuff later. But at this point, his, his face was kind of mutilated. It was probably black and blue. I mean, sure, he's swollen already. All right, sorry. But I just want you to get the reality of it. I think it's good for even children to know what Jesus went through. It makes me cry. You know, I've cried many times over the physical pain but think about what was happening in his heart like the depth of pain here are these people who he loves he cares so deeply about it he's literally taking it and when they pr said prophesy prophecy tends to be usually there's different meanings but one of the meanings especially in the old testament was future telling like prophesying where god gives you a message of what's going to happen in the future well this was a different way of prophesying it's like you know tell us your secret knowledge if you're the messiah surely you know who hit you I mean, it was mocking him making fun of him all right we go uh go on we're in these trials right here um we're still talking about them we're going pretty lengthy on this stuff because this is the biggest climax of the of the gospels on us who he may have had some words there and there can can be some of the things that were spoken by the way um in the book of John, he, it, it says that he was the first one, but also there's some statements when we get to the John that could have been to him and not to him. And then we have Caiaphas, um, Caiaphas uh, and others and all. And this is, now I want to go into what happened during this time with Peter. We'll get to these coming up here. This starts in the next chapter of Matthew. Um, but let's talk about Peter, Simon. You know, Simon was his name and Jesus gave him the nickname. And uh, what, 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 what was going on? Remember, I love this guy, <laughs> even though he messed up and we're going to see his mess up really big. I'll see if I can do it in this video. I might have to do another one, a part one, part two about Peter's denials. But um, as you remember, Jesus predicted that he's going to deny him three times before the rooster crows, you know, twice, you know, you know, he said before the rooster crows and he did do it twice. This is pretty much between 12 o'clock at midnight, midnight to about three o'clock, I would say. It could be two o'clock or whatever. And there was a lot of waiting here and there, like after the, in between the trials. The third trial, the Sanhedrin, um, that is written on my uh, outline there that I've sh shared with you, I'll bring it up again just to make sure you see it, um, was this one right here is when they came back together. I think this is when he got 
like beat up and all. And then they they came back for an official like okay planning strategy. I think I mentioned that last time. But in, in other words, they came back to the council and they really wanted to make sure they had a plan to go to this pilot. They figured out a plot of what what are we going to do? We got to try and persuade and and convince and manipulate pilot into killing him. They hated Jesus and the world hates Jesus. All right, but anyway, so here it is. Um, um, now we have the, the, the possible locations of Annas and Caiaphas right here. Um, yeah, here is potentially his house. It could have been a little bit more over here or maybe up here in the upper city. Palace of Herod, by the way, is right about in here, but you know, we'll get to that. Well, I'm not sure. If, I, I don't think we'll ever get to that. Um, I don't think Jesus went there. It's possible, but I don't think so. But anyway, that's in history. Now, um, I showed you one of the uh, models of a house, of, of the houses and the homes, especially the more rich, the richer ones, more wealthy. Um, and so here's another model of even a more expensive home here. Look at the number of rooms. And, the, and this is like, there could be far more than this too. But if you can see uh, down here is the doorway right here that you can close up. And there's a lot of times it's a huge gate. I mean, with fenced things to enter into the porch, which could have been uncovered. You know, it's like a porch area or it could have been covered. But they uh, here's the door right here entering into the um, into this palace. Now, I said that some of the writers have said the palace was a courtyard, but I think as I've studied it more, this is the palace and the courtyard is in the middle of the surrounding um, four sides of the home or the palace, an actual palace. And then if you could see down here, you have uh, layers of steps. You have these steps, you have this, 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 some going up this way, some going up that way. And, uh, and then you could have like two layers or three layers, like buildings on top of each other. This becomes really big and expensive. It's kind of like what we would call a, a small mansion or sometimes even a bigger mansion. And in history, there are those, and they found it in archaeological digs, there's one court, like maybe that's Caiaphas, or um, it could, there are some places that are found to have two or three courts, like they have this courtyard here, and then they have another one, like this is attached to another building, it goes out, out further. Um, so there could be like two or three courts, courtyards, like a big open area and that circle represents like a fountain or a cistern to uh, hold water, a literal fountain that's springing up. And by the way, some of them, literally the courtyards were so large, they had gardens and they had trees. They had pomegranate trees, olive trees, very interesting. They had food growing right there. They had trees and grass and everything in this outdoor thing. So uh, maybe some of them had that awning that you could put across. Many of them didn't. It was just totally open. And then you have all these rooms of the, uh, of the um, palace here. Uh, so this, these guys had a palace, Caiaphas and Annas. And it seems that there's two separate ones. Maybe there was the same, but it seems there are two separate ones. In Damascus, one of the oldest cities in the world, there's actually one right here that they've they've had. They have some uh, seven courts and some of their their uh, housing, seven courtyards. This is like really large. With just goes on and on. You go through here in a maze. It's like a maze, and you go out and here's another courtyard. Maybe some of them were smaller, some were larger. Seven of these areas that you can come out and you know sit in or like kind of a garden area, yard area, and it's enclosed. Again, there were no windows on the outside. They wanted the prophecy, so it was just kind of bare walls. Um, maybe some of them decorated. Maybe there's trees on the outside of this kind of to enclose this whole area. And the family could just go out there or you could have parties uh, and light it up right out here for night parties and things like this. Um, so I say all this because I believe uh, that there were two layers here, at least two levels, big home of Caiaphas. Uh, and then kings, by the way, had a number of courts. Like uh, kings had like this and then another one and another one, just tons and tons. Like it was huge acres of it. Anyway, uh, so there's stairs uh, almost for sure in Caiaphas. And in the book of Mark, it literally says that Peter was beneath in the lower area of the palace. Okay, so that sounds like there was an upper area. 
And by the way, I, I wanted to say this last time and I didn't really talk about it. Do you see these circles right here that's around the square area there? Uh, those circles actually are like pillars. And the Bible talks about different pillars. Uh, even mentioned in the book of Proverbs, it literally says in chapter 9, verse 1 about wisdom has built her pi pillars of her house, has built her house of pillars. So some of the larger, more wealthy homes had the second levels with pillars, like big round stone pipes, you know, that type of thing. And, uh, and they had in this, and I forgot to say this, I wanted to in the last time, but this time I'm remembering it. Uh, you would go up these stairs and, and, and oh, down the stairs, first of all, there's kind of like a hallway that goes all the way across. It could be 9, 10, 11 feet wide, and, you, and there's pillars, and you're walking underneath the roof. There's a roof area around this. Or you can literally go upstairs, and, and then that's where the banister, you know, that bar, that, that railing up there that it would be uh, over uh, up there. Um, on the inside, it may be on the outside of some of them, but on the inside, it would be a, a, a pillar and then you could like a balcony, you know, just up above a gallery up there. So that's where Peter was below. And I think on this almost for sure, the second floor is where the trial was held in one of those rooms uh, in those maybe chambers, a council room where he used it to maybe have this trial in, you know, and that's where uh, Jesus was. Okay, that's important for uh, other parts of the story that we're going to get into. Okay, let's get into the story, what happened. So let's go back to the first trial. Peter got in, if you remember, John came along, almost for sure it was John because John wrote about it, and he didn't mention his name. Anyway, John came along, and it doesn't seem like there's any danger for him. As a matter of fact, it's very possible that Peter was not even in any danger, but he thought he was. We're not sure. Um, but John was more important, and they knew him, and so uh, they didn't really say anything to him. He was inside. He was somewhere in there. I don't know if he was. I doubt if he was actually in the trial, but maybe he was up in the upstairs waiting. There's a lot of people there, by the way. Um, it, it seems evident because of these, these stories here. Okay, so um, now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard. Now you know he's in that, in that open area here. Uh, and the Bible says as he was outside uh, there, well, he was literally outside, but outside of where Jesus was in one of the other Gospels. Anyway, now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a damsel, a maid, a servant girl, a slave girl, uh, who was, you know, who was there, and she ap actually, she was one of them who kept the gate and the door, and there was another one there too, at least two, probably a bunch of them. A servant girl came to him. She kind of came up to him while he was out there in the courtyard, and by the way, if you remember, there was a fire burned by coals. They put it out in that area, and, you know, it's large enough to have maybe a fountain, or maybe it wasn't a fountain, and this one doesn't say, but there was fire right there, and they warmed their, ha their hands, because it was kind of cold, and it does get cold in the evenings in Israel. Uh, and then she said, you also, were, uh, you, you also were with Jesus of Galilee, and, and, and if you put them all together, there's different ways of saying it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, and one of them mentioned the Nazarene, that he was a Nazarene, that they knew about this Jesus of Nazarene. You know, the people knew about this guy. He was pretty popular. And they knew he was in the house right here. And she kind of looked by the light of the fire. I think he was, it, it, Bible, if you put them together, different ones say he stood, and then it says he sat. A couple of them said he was standing, warming his hands. So he was standing for a while, and they probably all sat down. So it was kind of both. He stood for a while, and then they sat down. So he was sitting. And then it says, and here it says it in, in Matthew, by this time he was sitting. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and the servant girl came and said, hey, you were, and I think, literally the Bible, the Greek says he, he, um, it was lit up, like his face kind of lit up here by the light of the fire. He was close enough that she could see him and said, you were also with Jesus of Galilee. Okay. Now, right at this point, his, his heart, you know, he was kind of hiding himself here. And, uh, but he, uh, he, uh, froze like his heart just went fearful right away. And he denied right there. Jesus says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Well, instead of denying himself, he, he denied Jesus. He denied, said no to knowing Jesus. Here's what it says. It says, I don't know what you're talking about. 
like, I don't know what you're even talking about, lady. You know, and, and, and he says, uh, no, I don't know him. He says, I don't know him. And I don't know what you're talking about. So he said, no, I don't know him. Uh, then he went out to the gateway. And that's that place earlier that I was trying to point out. So he was somewhere here in, in this area where the fire was burning. And then he went out here uh, and out over there. This porch area was right here. There's a porch, like kind of like houses a day. You have a porch in front of your house or something. So he, he went right there and there were, there were some people there. If you read it carefully, and I've read these quite a bit here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, there were some out here. And there was also another girl, young girl. And, and by the way, in Acts 12, as a matter of fact, Peter is part of that story too. In Acts 12, there's a girl named Rhoda. So the Jewish people hired and had ones who kind of opened the door, you know, once they, they were kind of opening the door for people like, you know, like a maid or something. And so she was, there was another one out here. It's definitely pretty close, pretty clear that it was a different girl on how it says it, you know, a different girl was right there. And she uh, says, oh, wait. You know, and she says, weren't you one of them? Like this, she, she does the same thing. And there's a guy in the book of Luke, it says there's a man, because he's a man, I don't know the man. You know, he literally said man. And it's another person is what Luke said, meaning there was a uh, another person from here. And he came here, and I think it's like they both were saying it together. So it was a girl plus a man who was accusing him. Uh, of uh, of like, hey, you're one of this. You're one of these disciples. You're one of these guys who was with Jesus. And here's Jesus in a trial right now. Peter was like, they're going to put me on trial too. They're going to bind me up. Uh, so it says. Then he went out of the gateway. There was another girl who saw him and said to the people there, said, Hey, wait. There, she's saying it to, to the people there. So there were other people in the porch area by the gate. It's like, why was he going over there? He kind of got out of that area. Oh, I do want to mention this, that if you really put all the Gospels together, on the first denial, he said it loud enough so everybody could hear. He wanted everybody to know. Like, I'm not, I don't know the man. What are you guys, what are you talking about, lady? He didn't say lady, but anyway. And uh, this time it says, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. So... Um, the first one said something about Jesus of Galilee. This is saying Jesus of Nazareth. And, uh, and then he said, um, he denied it again, this time with an oath. Uh-oh, the Bible says don't swear. Remember, Jesus himself taught that, and here's Peter swearing. He says, like with an oath, I swear to God, or I swear I don't know the man. I'm swearing like an oath, a promise. I promise I don't know. The Bible says let your yes be yes and your no be no. You don't have to say I promise or I swear and all that. So he swore. It doesn't say exactly his words. He may have said, I swear by Jehovah, you know, Yahweh. Ugh. You know, I don't know, but he, he swore right this. So he got more agitated. He was more nervous and he, he added to his first sin. He's sinning because he's flat lying. He's lying. He knows Jesus. And now this is a really serious one. It says, listen, what, like, listen to the words, particularly what, what Peter said. I don't know the man. The man, this is his beloved friend. This is his beloved master, his teacher, his rabbi, his, his, his partner, his companion, his friendship. He's deep. These guys are really close. He's been with them for about three and a half years. I don't know the man. The man, he calls him. Ugh. <laughs> wow. Really tough. He's denying Jesus that he even knows him. Next one. We'll go on. Uh, so he left that area, and we find him back going to the courtyard around the fire again, uh, and it, you know, and then he's out there. And this time, two of the gospels say, after a little while, in Luke's gospel, it says it was about an hour. So this is like again, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. People are just hanging out there because of these trials. Like they should be in bed, <laughs> but uh, you know, the Jewish leadership. Well, I'm sorry, I kicked the uh, camera there. The Jewish leadership was, you know, trying to get Jesus. And it was all while Jerusalem around that whole area was sleeping. After a little while, then after a little while, this one says this. Um, Those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you're one of them for your accent gives you away. Now, if you put them all together, he, he, they're saying to him that, look, you are, you are the one, um, you're, you're, 
him, you're a Galilean. They even mentioned, hey, you're from Galilee, one of them says. They were all accusing him, like, hey, you have an accent. So it's my opinion that I, you kind of wonder about this. How did they hear? Well, they heard him earlier, and then they heard him speak again, uh, probably sitting at the fire so he doesn't just sit quietly over was talking. They'll kind of go, who is this guy? Why isn't he saying anything? So he spoke, and they all kind of looked at him, and some of them, finally they started saying, you know, you're one of them, aren't you? They're attacking him again. Not attacking him, but saying, hey, you're one of these guys. And so um, now what does it mean he spoke Galilean, a Galilean accent? Well, some have suggested that Syria, which is above there, that the accents and the way they spoke the uh, language of that day in Israel. If you remember, Galilee's up here. Galilee, you've been with me for a while. You know this. Galilee, Samaria, Judea. He's down here right now among the Judeans, the Jewish people from Judea. He lives up here, and that's where Jesus hung out, and that's where Jesus grew up. And so he developed some sort of northern accent. Um, there's three languages, and, and especially two, that were used quite a bit in those days. So a lot of the people in the, especially the lower Galilee portion, they spoke Aramaic and they spoke Greek a lot. Some of the people, uh, Greek was the official language uh, and all. And they may have known a little Latin because that's Rome's language, but Greek was the universal language. That's why the Bible was written in Greek, by the way. Koine Greek, a certain type of Greek. And also uh, they knew Hebrew. Because of the Old Testament, which is all they had was the Old Testament Bible, that was Hebrew. And so they kind of knew at least two. Uh, some of them knew definitely Aramaic, which is sort of a cousin or a sister or not identical trans, but they're offshoots of the same language, a Semitic language, Aramaic and Hebrew come pretty close together there. And uh, Syria, some have suggested that they, it was a Syrian uh, dialect. The accent was drawn from them, but it's not, I'm not sure yet. Uh, but anyway, the point is, is they had different, uh, different accents. And I, in studies, this is what you can know about the Galilean speech. And this is what they heard him speak like. Um, they couldn't and failed to speak their gutturals right. They, they tended to not, be able, not to be able to distinguish and separate the gutturals. So what's a guttural? It's, it's a kind of a sound in your throat that comes out... Um, and usually it's a harsh, like it might be mashik. Hear that mashik, and I laugh. You know that, like hear that. <laughs> like why don't you try it? If you're a child, you could try it. Um, Gordon. <laughs> no, I'm just. Kidding. All right, Yeshua. You know something. There's a guttural sound. Now theirs seem to be softer. It's a softer sound than the harder ones maybe below in the south area. But they couldn't and failed to speak their gutturals right, according to the Judean Christian. I mean, not Christians, Judean, the Jews from Judea. And by the way, there was a prejudice against these Galileans. They didn't like how they spoke. And I'll show you why, some of the reasons. But they kind of looked down on them, especially the upper educated ones in Ju Jerusalem and, and all that kind of looked at their brothers up there, their you know, fellow Jews, and they kind of looked down. That's how people are nowadays. And, you know, there's different people that look at different people that are different. You know, they're different. They have this, oh, look at you, how you talk. Um, these people weren't like, they were pretty smart and they were traders up there, traders, like traded different things. They also could have gained other languages because they had all this in the in the Judea, or I mean, in the Galilee area. If this is Galilee up here, people came right through there all the time from other countries, and they were traveling, you know, to go south. They went through. If I've told you about that Capernaum and Galilee and all that, so they picked up different uh, styles of different languages and all. Uh, so the the other, I said, in the throat, it's that harsh sounding thing that they used to have. Uh, they basically felt like they had sloppy speech. The Galileans had sloppy speech that they didn't really speak clearly. They don't. They didn't. They didn't. I guess. Uh, kind of not exact. That's kind of a key thing that the Judeans felt like they were that they didn't speak, and maybe they didn't. Galileans didn't speak exact. It's like they had a slur to their language in their dialect. You know, it's kind of like different parts of our, even the United States, in northern part and Boston and around that area, they speak different. And New York has their sort of area of speaking different ways. In my area, some say I have a southern accent because I'm from Cincinnati and things. Or there's also um, things such as uh, the down south, 
now I'm not this is not making fun but some people have a certain slang to their you know they have that that draw to their words well that was kind of what the Galileans evidently up north said uh, how they talk the vowels and consonants were not clear and recognized the vowels a e i o u and consonants wasn't really recognized they can't and by the way they literally said you can't speak in the temple they didn't let Galileans speak in the temple because they felt like it was going to offend God because of their language yeah right not at all but that's that uppity snobbish you know attitude they look down on these people because they're they're the way they talked um don't look down on people on how they talk and all it's kind of crazy don't be like the these people and not all of them i'm sure but you know when we say the judeans it's not all of them there's some wonderful people who are totally different i'm sure but a lot of the uh, upper upper class you know people I may mean, not all of them either I'm pretty sure they weren't uh, the spelling they even said had examples like double letters they would to especially the vowels they would say you you and uh, to emphasize a particular way of saying so and their spelling it was all over the place you know and uh, in antiquity I've said this many times ancient times the spelling is all over the place anyway I don't think kids had any spelling bees back then yay because <laughs> there was a lot of different sp ways of spelling and there was also a variety I mentioned to you in Galilee, a variety of people going through there from the Mesopotamia world or Mediterranean, you know, where, where area. Uh, one, uh, there was only one way in Judea. See, they had their uh, they had their own one way of speech where there is a variety there. Um, they even left out syllables and words, like instead of L A U L A L or some or L U L, they had L L. They just left them out in the way they say it and also wrote it. Um, basically, they felt like uh, 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 that they weren't pure and they were corrupt. Like the, uh, the Judeans had a view that the uh, Galileans couldn't speak right and they didn't like them. And so, but in this case, I think he gave himself away. I think Peter, because he's probably talked for a while and you know that, they realized he had an accent or something in, in his speech that made him a Galilean. And they knew that the movement of Jesus this that the disciples came from Galilee almost all of them it does, it's not clear in every one of them uh, but it seems like maybe Judas of Iscariot wasn't uh, he, he could have been from Judea or something but let me go on it says then began he to oh a little while those standing there uh, went up to Peter again and surely you're one of them your accent gives you away you're a Galilean is what one of the gospel writers said uh, and by the way, this third one, John actually mentions something else about this one. One of them literally came up, get this, he was a kinsman, he was a family member of Malchus. Remember the guy who Peter cut off his ear? And that guy was in the garden. And he wasn't sure, he said, aren't you one of the guys? He didn't even realize probably that that was a guy that cut off his Malchus ear. But he recognized, he kind of remembers him in that dark night. He seems like those are the same features, the same guy. It was the same guy. Excuse me. It was literally a family member of Malchus that asked him that. Excuse me. And so then he began, then it said, surely you're one of them, but your accent gives you away. Then he began to do two things. Cursed and swore. He swore again, like, I promise, I, I, I swear to God. God, or I swear, swear in my mama's grave, or whatever. I swear that I didn't. I don't know him. But it says cursed. Now, what we say a lot of times, curses means um, like cussing. You know, saying bad words. I don't think he cussed. I used to think that until you find out what that curse actually means. And I've got the actual Greek word. Um, this this new board that I don't think I've ever shown you before. Um, I've kind of had it uh, for a while here, and this is actually letters in the Hebrew in the Old Testament. I don't have one in the Greek. If I ever find a Greek one, I'll buy it. Like, so you see these letters, and when we get into the Old Testament and when we get into Greek uh, things, you're going to learn some of the alphabet in the, in the Hebrew. But this one right here is actually the Greek. The word curse in Greek is that word right there. I'm not going to even try and pronounce it, but do you see all those letters? Uh, there's the Greek letters right there. I tried to copy what it, it actually looks like. Can you see that long word right there? Uh, K-A-R-A, -A, you know, that thing all the way across. And, uh, and then it, he was basically saying, this is really deep, that word, this is really tough. He went really out there. He was pronouncing upon himself an eternal anathema. 
okay, a curse of condemnation. He was basically saying, hey, I'll, I'll tell you right now, if I know that guy, then let me be cursed forever. He didn't say the word forever, but that's basically what he's saying. Let me be damned or, you know, that, uh, that word is not a bad word. It's actually used in the Bible if it's used in the proper way, which I did. Uh, condemned, uh, cursed, condemned, put down, basically out of the presence of God forever. The word is D-A-M-N-E-D, damned, you know, like curse, condemned. That word, if you use it in a cuss word, you shouldn't use it, like, you know, using that in a wrong way. But he was, he was basically damning himself, condemning himself to uh, uh, fires of hell, basically. And God did not hold him to that, thank God. All right, so I could leave you right there hanging at what happens next, but I, I won't. I, this is going so long. Uh, then it says um, uh, immediately, guess what happened? You guys know what happened? A rooster crowed. Remember the rooster? He crowed. By the way, I, I failed in saying that this rooster, and usually roosters aren't really in the Talmud, it says, which was l written like 200 years later or whatever. Two, there's 200 AD and also 400 and all. These different Talmuds, these writings said they, were, they weren't supposed to have any roosters or hens in Jerusalem because they were unclean animals and they didn't want them to touch any of the holy uh, uh, animals there. I mean, animals, the things, the holy things in, in Jerusalem. But um, other writings have suggested there were roosters. So there definitely was a rooster unless that rooster broke in there because of the Spirit of God and made him come in there because of Jesus' predictions. Or maybe he said it loud enough they could. No, I don't think so. Anyway, the rooster crowed. Now, after the first denial, remember that girl? The rooster crowed right then. Mark says it. Bam. And then after the third denial, after the first one and the third, that went, ah, 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 you know, did it again right at that time. And the Bible says at that time that Peter remembered the word of Jesus. But let me tell you something that Luke says. He's the only one that mentions it. It's beautiful. Oh, I'm saying all these wonderful stories, all of it together. I'll get into it again when we repeat this when we go to Luke. Luke 22, it says this, that in Luke's gospel, it says that when he denied and, and the, the rooster crowed, it says that Jesus, the Lord, turned and looked at him. In my opinion, either two, one of two things, and I think it was probably this number one, that Jesus was up in the, uh, one of those upper rooms and it had calmed down and it, it, you know, it was like a later and he was just waiting there. Or it could have been, maybe it wasn't, maybe it was in between questions, but I think it was probably calm. And then it says, the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. He may have been standing there and watching the whole thing, by the way. Uh, but I don't think so. I think he turned at this point and looked at Peter and their eyes met eye to eye. They looked at each other. And it says, I mean, think about what that was like. Jesus looked at him. Now, how did he look? Peter, you said you weren't going to deny me. Didn't I say you were? No, he didn't look at him at all like that, in my opinion. I think he was full of compassion who knows, maybe tears welled up in his eyes. Not poor me, you're, re you're rejecting me. Jesus loved Peter at that time. And I think his warmth and his love and a reproach, kind of like I said, that would happen, Peter. Like a reproach, a soft rebuke. Sort of like what Jesus did in the garden. Remember I said, he said, friend, you betray me like a, with a kiss. Um, and that was a reproach. It kind of, you should, like a reproach, by the way, means... Uh, like a correction, you shouldn't be doing this. But I think maybe on the, on the other hand that when, when Jesus looked at Judas and he looked at him and said this, that could have been a, an invitation again for you to please like try it again. Look at the patience of God and the love of Jesus. Wow, what a savior. And he was reaching for him. Friend, are you gonna betray me with a kiss like this? And go ahead and do what you're going to do, you know, but I think that could have burned in his, it could have burned in his mind and his heart, but it doesn't seem to have, um, because if Judas did not come back to Jesus um, and did not repent for his sin. So, uh, so Peter looks at Jesus and I think he looked into, into Peter, like deep into his soul. 
and he felt that. He probably never forgot that look as long as he lived. Uh, he Remember, he looked at Jesus the very first time. Uh, I mean, Jesus looked at Peter uh, the very first time he met him. Remember in John chapter 1, and uh, he, it says he beheld him. He looked at him. He looked at, and so that look penetrated him there, and he called him a rock. And at this point, he looked at him again. He fastened his eyes into his soul. And that's when Peter, oh, bless his heart. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus has spoken before the rooster crows. You will deny me. You will disown me. You will say, I don't know you three times. That's what just happened. He predicted that. He knew it. Behold the knowledge of God and behold the knowledge of Jesus. And he went outside. He left quickly. He went out of the courtyard, went through the porch, went through the gate, and somewhere in Jerusalem, there's someone outside of Jerusalem. Maybe he went down to the lower part because he could have been pretty close to those, some of those gates. Maybe the gate, uh, the dung gate, you know, the garbage gate, but he felt like I should go down there. And he went out, and somewhere he found, a, he, he wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. That word bitterness has to do with gut level, gut rending, wrenching, way down deep inside. He felt horrible and sick. And it, and it seems to say there that he wept bitterly, and he cried and cried and cried and cried and cried and cried. And cried. Tons and tons of tears. But also, Jesus did say in that Luke passage before that, before this whole thing, it's, I pray for you and that you'll be converted when you're going to be converted. So he probably remembered those words and Jesus gave him hope. But anyway, the last thing I want to say, which is kind of crazy, I have so much, is this one, is uh, Judas and Peter. Like, look at the difference between the two. And I think these writers are contrasting some of this. One is Judas was a disciple, Peter was a disciple. They were both followers of Jesus. They were both chosen by Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus knew that he was going to tr betray him from the beginning. So the Spirit of God came on Jesus and showed him that, you know, that he knew that that it was going to happen. The apostles, uh, they were both apostles. They both had power to heal the sick and cast out demons. Both experienced the power of God in their lives. Isn't that interesting? Judas did too. Um, he was a thief. You know, that was clear and we've talked about that. And, uh, and he had a problem with his tongue, <laughs> you know, he, his mouth, Peter had a mouth, he just that said things at the wrong time in the wrong place and all. Uh, also, um, we don't know the motives here. I'm going to talk about that later. My opinions of why Judas uh, went through with all this. Per per first of all, he definitely had uh, a motive of money. That's pretty clear. He wanted some money, but I think it's deeper than that. And I'll tell you why as we get into that. It's in the next chapter, as a matter of fact. Then uh, Peter had pride. See, he, he, Peter had pride, meaning he, he had self-confidence. He said, if everybody else denies you, I'm not going to. I'll die for you. You know, he led the troops in saying that. And he said, I don't care what these guys do. Like he had this thing about himself that I can do it. You can't do the Christian life in your own strength. You can't live like Jesus without Jesus living it through you. Uh, so there's power in these stories here. And there's so much wonderful stuff. God did forgive him and, and not, not Judas. And we'll see why. Well, I think God would have forgiven Judas, in my opinion. Jesus would have forgiven him too. But they took different directions. Pride was, uh, was Peter's uh, thing and it, it made him fall. Pride comes before fall. The Bible says, he that thinks he stands, take heed, be careful, pay attention, lest you fall in case you're going to fall. That's 1 Corinthians 10. All right, then it says um, here that I put down there, Satan entered him. Okay, he first gave him the heart and the idea of betrayal, and then he literally entered him. Satan tempted him. He didn't enter uh, Peter and became, you know, inside him, but he was tempted and he fell. Satan was behind this. Um, he betrayed him, and guess what? Peter did too. Both of them betrayed. But one had a, a different reaction than the other. One went to Jesus and, you know, and went to God and wept bitterly and cried out for forgiveness from God. He felt so horrible. Um, and by the way, in, in tradition, it's not in the Bible, there's a tradition that Peter, every time for the rest of his life, he ever heard a uh, rooster crow, which is pretty often where he lived in Israel and all, he, he wept and he cried, he prayed, but I'm not sure, you know, uh, if that's true, but that is a story that came afterwards. And, but both of them betrayed, and we can betray Jesus too. I've betrayed many times in the sense I fell before, you know, like... I should have done this, I shouldn't have done this, I sinned and all that. But these are pretty monstrous things here 
both of them, but you know, both of them betrayed him. He betrayed Jesus. Peter did betray him. Now he planned it. He didn't plan it. He was at a point of weakness. So there is one that's worse than the other. All right. And then the uh, last thing is that it seems like uh, Judas will get to had some sort of remorse and all. He kind of knew he blew it and he, he, may, he was, I don't know, sad and all. But he did the wrong thing, which we'll find out what he did if you don't know. And then, but Jesus, I mean, Peter repented. So, and there's also a, a difference between the confession of Jesus. Remember, he just confessed, I'm the Christ, son of the living God and all. I, I was the son of man will see, you know, see, uh, will sit at the right hand of God and come in power and clouds. So he had a great confession knowing that he was going to die. But Peter confessed, uh, he did, his confession was denial, uh, trying to be saved from death. He did not want to die. And we don't even know if they were going to do that. They knew John was a disciple, or that one did. Uh, the, evidently, they knew him somewhat in there. All right, I spoke a whole lot. This is a lot of information. We've just gotten through the uh, really sad but marvelous story of Peter's denials and how Jesus looked at him, and it's a highlight. And, uh, and just, I think the writers wrote that in there for many different reasons, but number one, they're being honest. This is like, no, we didn't make up these stories. Look at, look at what we were like. We all deserted him and, you know, and then Peter denied him. Like they, they, you're not going to make up stories, fantasies and fictions. And, uh, if it's not true and say all you, how horrible you were acting and everything. Uh, and also it, it shows how God forgave them all and God loved them all all the way through that. So that gives you hope and gives me hope when we fail. And yes, you will fail. I have failed Jesus innumerable times. Can't tell you how many. And yet God's there and he forgives. It's wonderful. All right, God bless you. Thanks for listening. Long video, sorry, but I shouldn't say I'm sorry. It's good. All right, thanks for listening.